Let's just get back. I want to just get back for a moment. Matt Stoller has a, a pretty good uh, thread on this question of of the Democrats and how they should respond. I mean, this is presuming that Joe Biden wins. Uh, there is now internal concern that Dianne Feinstein, who is 87 years old, is not up to the task of running the Judiciary Committee uh, or not running the Judiciary Committee, I should say, running the or being the minority, uh, the senior minority uh, member of the Judiciary Committee, running, I guess, the Democratic strategy on the Judiciary Committee when it comes to these Supreme Court hearings. She's 87. And um, I find it, you know, it's hard to imagine that someone who is 87 is at the top of their game. I'm sorry. I mean, I, I have parents in my 80s. I'm not my 80s, their 80s. And um, they're much, their early 80s, I think. Uh, but it is, Diane Feinstein is, um, I don't know. That's not the first person I would pick if I wanted to go to battle. But here, put up this Matt Stoller uh, thing, because he also has a, um, he says, the right way to address the conservative takeover of the courts is to actually pass bills, try to govern in a way uh, people, I'm trying to, I can't, uh, there we go, people, people like. If the courts stop you, then you fight them. But the whole pack the court first gets the sequencing backwards. I, I mean, I agree with this. I think the I think it's I think it's important to talk about packing the courts. I think it's important to get uh, people into the 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 mind frame of like this should happen. Um, the problem with the just packing the courts right now is that it is about the process. Insofar as the reason why people are saying pack the courts right now is exclusively because the Republicans stole a seat. I mean, you could argue that they they either stole that seat last time and this one's okay, or they they stole this one and the last one is um, is is okay. They're inconsistent. And that's the only reason given to pack the courts. However, keep going back to the Stoller thing. However, what he's saying is you need to be a little bit more like, like what FDR did, which is here's stuff that, that people like and the courts are about to take it away. And then you can go back to the idea of, of, Hey, the, not only are they taking away stuff that people like, but they're there illegitimately. Scroll back up for a moment. I just want to read this to folks. Uh, the right way for Democrats to address the conservative takeover of the courts is to actually pass bills and then try and govern in a way people like. If the courts stop you, then you fight them. But the whole pack, the court first gets the sequencing backwards. Democrats haven't come to grips with how the courts are stepping into a void that legislators have left. This is important. He says, sure, the courts can create absurd constitutional limits, but more generally, the courts interpret legal ambiguities, ambiguities in statutes. Congress can just rewrite the statute. It doesn't. Now, they need to, um, and what he's saying is that they need to like engage in this battle. For instance, Nancy Pelosi could have included in that continuing resolution one line that would have made the court case about the ACA moot and challenged Mitch McConnell, you want to shut down the government because we want to get rid of the ACA mandate? Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, you want us to take that out? All right, American people, Mitch McConnell wants to reinstate the mandate. And that's the price he's, 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 he's holding the government hostage to do that. What? I mean, just... What a missed opportunity just from a messaging standpoint, just from just a, I mean, just making Mitch McConnell get out there. So then her assessment is that it would be better if 
they did repeal the ACA entirely and they have no plan ultimately to come in with after Look, the fact that people lose health. It's unclear whether the, the court will will shut down the, the ACA. It's going to take some time because they it needs to go back down to the court and then the district court guy needs to decide whether it's severable and then it goes back up to the Supreme Court to find out if it's severable. And then conceivably, conceivably, it's possible that by the time all that I just explained happens or in the course of that, that the the House and the Senate and the presidency will be in the hands of Democrats and that will be fixed. But they do not see the value of fighting and, and making the, the Republicans do anything. They, their entire strategy for this election is just a referendum on the Republicans without us even providing commentary as to why they're bad. It's a strategy. It may work because, you know, Donald Trump is horrific, but it doesn't set you up to do anything. And it's no guarantee. It's no guarantee. Uh, but go back to the Stoller uh, tweet for a second. Because he has one more uh, comment, which I appreciate. It's uh, back to the um, my work in progress, blame the voters. Uh, he goes on to say, Democratic voters do not want to pick leaders who govern. That is why Dianne Feinstein is an 87-year-old, incredibly lazy senator from California. Uh, I mean, he worked in the, the, I think, in the House, and I'm not sure if he worked in the Senate, so maybe he heard things. I don't know. She's lazy, uh, but she doesn't seem terribly aggressive to me. <laughs> California dispatching her primary opponents uh, from California, who dispatched her primary opponents with relative ease. Democratic voters want the status quo protected by their courts. Blaming the voter, I think it's hard to argue with that. And... Um, And, and uh, somebody wrote back, they need to uh, a strong governing majority to do that, but you're correct. And he says, no, they don't need to do uh, work. It's hard to convey how fundamentally lazy most Democratic leaders are. The contrast is the antitrust subcommittee, which has made serious progress because the members do document review. Well, now he's getting into sort of like more, you know, inside a uh, baseball, but he may be right. I mean, I think Lawmakers in general seem to be incredibly lazy and the Republicans have it a little bit easier because it doesn't involve any real thought in what they're trying to do at any given time. But the, the basic premise is there, which is to wage any of these fights, to win any of these fights, you need to propose legislation. Sometimes you pass it, sometimes you don't legislation that has material benefits for people so that people get upset when somebody stands in the way of that legislation impacting their lives. And if you don't have that, then all of this is just, it, 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 it is, it's yeah. thin. And also, if you don't have that, you can't really blame the voters for being apathetic because they've never gotten any sign that uh, Democrats are going to do anything for them if they vote them in. Well, they did vote in a Democrat. That's the problem here, is that they're all Democrats in California. They had an opportunity to get rid of a bad senator, and they didn't. So you can blame the... the... Well, I think a lot of that is down to low turnout and voter apathy, right? Sure, some people are still going to vote, but turnout a wasn't lot, that low in a the lot more people would vote. For don't you think if uh, I mean, we don't know, actually. <laughs> no, we don't. But we do know that she had no problem getting rid of her primary opponents. And so the bottom line is, is that Democratic voters need to care more about this stuff. Sure. Right? I but mean, the, the process, like the buck doesn't stop there. Right. Like, why do they care so little about this stuff? It's because they've been depoliticized for decades and decades by a government that does very little for them. Also, you know, these larger forces like people are worried about their well, their well, food. People are well, worried about their housing. No, and they I don't. But they're still voting. What you're, the calculation you're saying, you're talking about non-voters. 
We're yeah. talking about voters. And, and, and voters people went who in, were like, whatever, guess I'll vote for the incumbent because I've heard of them. Right. It's laziness on the part of the voters, too. That's a problem. That's a where problem. Did, where does the laziness come from? I, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, you get, you know, if you go and vote for Diane Feinstein, you're going to get Diane Feinstein. I'm just saying it's a little bit idealist to think that um, these kinds of behaviors or shifts in behavior come from just just purely within people as individuals and not as part of a political economic process that's been happening for a really long time. But I certainly, get it. But certainly but that's part of it. Somehow vote. Uh, they're much more aggressive in voting for um for people who are you know supposedly you know th they are much more aggressive and less lazier about voting it seems to me and some maybe they just there maybe there are people who tell them who to vote for and they go and do it but um i i mean i, I you know yeah i mean it, the, it's the really Republican hard Party... to make the argument that all the things that you're talking about you know, I can I can understand that there are people who are disaffected by the process, and therefore they don't vote. Okay, I can understand that there are people who um, who who think that well, politics don't bring me anything, uh, and so therefore I'm not going to vote. But it's really hard to apply that dynamic to people who say politics don't bring me any, anything. Therefore, I'm going to vote for the incumbent. Well, it's complicated. Well, no, I understand it's complicated, but there there has to be another part of that story. And uh, I think that I, I, I think I think you know, the other part of the story is depoliticization. Like, yeah, I mean, look, I obviously the media and all this stuff and the Democrats like governing and what they've put been able to put on the table and willing to put on the table over the past 20 years has had an effect on this. But I think just the simple point Stoller is making is like. This is the reality of the electorate that we have right now, and it needs to change. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing. Is it, you know, you can argue that like there needs to be people who are out there who are, but why would, why, like, I don't, who is responsible for, you're basically saying Diane Feinstein basically puts everybody to sleep and then they come and vote for her. And I'm arguing that the, the voter has to have some agency in the process. Now, yes, I agree, obviously, that people need more information and need to understand these things and contextualize them. That's why we're here, right? But at the end of the day, there also has to be some measure of effort by the voter. And, um, you know, voting out the incumbent is one of the, you know, sort of like, that's a pretty base instinct. And if people aren't uh, following, I mean, like at one point there has to be some agency, right? I mean, in what it's, world is there no, is there, is there no agency? I mean, it's like people are making the time to go and vote. And I, don't I mean, know. they do and they don't, right? Because we know the biggest predictor of if someone's going to vote or not is how much money they have. But I'm and saying they're voting. We also know that like, even if you just look at New York city, um, uh, socialist candidates or DSA endorsed candidates do worse in really poor areas. And then in less poor areas, they do better. And then in once you hit a certain level of income, they do badly again, because those are rich people who are right. defending their interests. Um, does that mean that like, I'm not willing to blame the individuals in these poor areas who are voting for incumbents that they're just like, I don't know, they're lazy or whatever. Like there are so many factors driving them to vote for uh, these incumbents that act against their own class interests. And I'm not willing to put it all on the individuals because I think that's uh, that's a mistake. I would imagine and it's that a, Diane Feinstein. It's, it, it's almost kind of like Republican logic, right? Personal responsibility. Well, Diane Feinstein, I would imagine, gets support from across the income spectrum, and. Um, to do as well as she did against those, those people. And, and I guess, I guess if we have no responsibility uh, to participate 
in our electoral process. I don't know how you can have people expect to participate in anything. Well, I think the responsibility lies with the left and the people running against incumbents and the people running um, more progressive candidates to build the kinds of uh, working class and progressive institutions that would convince people that a you know this election matters and b it's possible to improve your lot by uh, voting for progressive candidates and i think the left has a lot of work to do where that's concerned but i'm not going to put 100% of the blame on people who are you know just trying to survive from day to day well, I mean, there's a lot of people who are not just trying to survive for a day who also voted for exactly. Well, that's the problem is like they've cultivated uh, a base of support. Feinstein cultivated this electorate, like uh, Feinstein types. They like not like having people that turn out to vote for them without expectation yeah. that they actually do work. Yeah. Right? They, they've actually accomplished this. It's our job to try to change people's minds about that. But the reality is like, it's a huge uphill battle. The same thing happened with Biden beating Bernie, right? Like we all would wish that Bernie would have in that Biden. instance though, but in that instance, at least there was a logic to it from the voters perspective, which is they thought that he had a better chance of beating Trump. But Feinstein's going up there and she's going to win. There's yeah. it's California is a well, democratic state. I mean, that is what makes it really the most egregious of all of it is that even the even like the, the, Feinstein's not is not even, um, I guess, championing the the interest of the people who want who who think that she is right. Like she's not. She, you know, if you are just a whatever, you know, a, a PMC or a neoliberal or whatever it is, and you go out there, Diane Feinstein's not necessarily championing like you're not you, you, you're, you're she's not protecting abortion rights. She's not protecting, um, you know, whatever, what, you know, I mean, she's 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 letting these the, the judiciary board just the, the, the walk all over everything they do. She's not messaging anything. She's not protecting any. I mean, surely the people who voted for her, even if we even if you disagree with what their issue sets are, surely they expect some type of results, but they're just not doing the work to, to realize that she does it. Well, the stakes are also a lot lower for richer people, which is why uh, I am harping on the poor and working class and the people who really, really have right, that's a not stake what we're talking in whether a whether a progressive is elected, but, but well, yeah, I, mean, I think listen, for a lot of people with money, um, it, they don't really care that much about these things. You know, they're still going to be able to get an abortion, whether it's legal or not. So, I mean, I think there are people who, who care, who care about, you know, abortion being, I mean, legal for, for other people. But, uh, but some breaking news, former, Louisville Metro Police Department officer Brett Hankinson is charged with three counts of wanton endangerment endangerment uh, in the first degree. Let's see here. Uh, Hankinson was fired on June 23rd for his role in the shooting death of Breonna Taylor. Louisville uh, Metro Police announced. Um, the Courier Journal, a person is guilty of wanton endangerment in the first degree when under circumstances manifesting extreme indifference to the value of human life, he wantonly engages in conduct which creates a substantial danger of death and serious physical injury to another person. Uh, it's a class D felony. That is, that's, that's not uh, manslaughter, I guess. I don't know where, frankly, I just don't know. Class D felony is punishable by one to five years in prison. Uh, for example, cultivating five or more marijuana plants is a class D. Oh, geez. Well, that contextualizes it. That seems to undersell the idea of coming in and just firing. So there it is. Um, Mike from PA tweeted out that he says he read through the... Uh... Uh, let's see if I can pull it up here. I um, read through it, and it looks like they're, the charges are, are uh, correspond to f bullets that went into other properties, like, you know, because of the shooting and not the killing of Breonna Taylor herself. Like that. It, Just the idea of, of firing off your weapon in a negligent manner or something. 
Yeah, not that the property. Like, yeah, not so not for like manslaughter or murder of Not John you. Taylor. Well, that's why they locked down. That's why they locked down. Yeah, be safe, everyone. Right. Be gonna, as safe you, as you can be. Um, let's go to. Oh, let's open up the phones. Zephi, uh, Sam, Feinstein is part of a political machine that turns out votes for her in her state. Progressives do not have that infrastructure. Progressives have the infrastructure in certain places to win low-level races, like in NYC. Now, as we saw with Bernie in Skarain, they don't have it to win statewide or national seats right now. The problem isn't uh, voter apathy. It's lack of political infrastructure for the left. Yes, no, I agree with that. But it's also, I mean, there is, I just, I mean, I agree um, with the idea that you obviously need to build political machines, right? I mean, that is why, in, 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 at least in part, as to why Bernie lost. There was just not the infrastructure and the support that you need to win that kind of election. But at the same time, you know, I think like citizens have some measure of responsibility to assess their um, who they vote for, at least, you know, your senators or your, you know, like I understand like uh, people don't have time maybe to like sort of like check the record of your state senator uh, in a general election. You, you, you look at the, the, the letter behind their name and you say, okay, that person should have come through the process and be reasonably close to where I am in this if uh, that's the way I vote. But um, it is not necessarily a, uh, I mean, a, you know, shouldn't be too difficult. Uh, I mean, part, part of this is like, I'm thinking about my own voting behavior. And I know for a fact, there is no way that I would know who any of the down ballot candidates are, the judges or anything. Oh, right. If I were not a member of a leftist organization that has people who do know these things and are willing to share that knowledge with me, right? That's an example of an institution that uh, helps people, helps people make those choices. So if you don't have that, like it's a lot, lot less likely that you're going to have that knowledge. Right. No, I agree. And, but the, the, and that, and that, and that's a very good example, but the question becomes at what point, how important is the political figure that it becomes incumbent upon you to engage? And like, I get the idea that like, Hey, I don't have time to find out what the, what the county judge I should be voting for or the, or the comptroller or, you know, or the state Senator. I can even see that, in, you know, Congressman, but there's only like, you know, she's been a Senator for a long time. And I can see it in some, some city, like, I don't know, would that be an excuse for the presidency? You know, because at one point we expect people to sort of like be able to make an assessment about politicians, understand ones that are, you know, way under the radar. But like, if someone was to say to you, like, you know, what? I just haven't, I haven't, I'm not paying that much of attention in terms of like this whole thing with Trump and the other guy who's running. Now, yeah, I, I, I would say like, okay, that is a voter that, you know, it's incumbent upon the, the Democrats to still convince to vote. You wouldn't do it in the same way. You would make it like Joe Biden's a good guy or something, or, you know, I don't know. But I would also say that voter, they're dropping the ball. They're not really paying attention enough for a country that they, you know, like, they, they're they're a bad citizen. Yeah, I guess I tend but to we, think it's more less useful to look at things in terms of individuals' uh, culpability or morality or I'm failure than it is in terms of a, a, a the, like the pa- systemic uh, patterns that bring these things okay. about. That's true, but I'm not saying culpability, and I'm not saying morality. I'm not saying they're a bad person. I'm saying they're a bad citizen. Well, like, I mean, America makes different. bad citizens as a rule. I think that's true too. 
I mean, I think that's. And true. I think, like with with Feinstein, I think people impose a realism on him from like that's just like the normal tone of political discourse in this country. That oh, Feinstein's the one on the ballot. I guess it's Feinstein then. Like, I mean, yeah, people should turn out to primaries, but that's a huge that's a huge uh, uh, task. And I think, like, I don't know when I when I was voting in North Dakota, it's like I'm voting for the Democrat. Like, they all sucked. They're all horrible. But it's like, I mean, the, that's why the horridness of the GOP, I think it, I don't know what it's like to be a former blue well, state, but, but I imagine it's like. But I, this is also the general, I think, when it comes to California in particular, I think she ran against Democrat in the general, if I remember correctly. It was the, uh, the guy from the, um, I can't remember his name now, I interviewed him. But in California, they have a jungle primary, right? I mean, daily uh, yeah, De Leon. I, she ran against De Leon, I think, in the statewide, in the general. So it's not even really we're talking about the primary in California, right? I mean, it's just like you had an option for two Democrats and you went with Feinstein. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I think the incumbency thing, like it doesn't surprise me. Yeah, no, I'm not surprised necessarily. And I'm not saying they're immoral people. Um, no, you're just the, saying they're bad the citizens. I'm this saying they're bad the citizens. Well, this is the result, I think, of a generation of um, leadership and realizing we don't have to cultivate them. We just have to maintain what we inherited from the New Deal. I think yeah. that's basically the Democratic Party's problem. I think that's I true. I think yeah. that's true. And the era of Reagan, basically, you know, telling people like, we, we've got this, we'll take care of this. You don't need to care about government and center it in your lives. And, and, and that you know, and, and, an entire, yeah, an entire generation of people voted for that. People yeah. under 30, 60 to 40 voted for Reagan in 1984. So that goes and, to show you what we're living with. And not just Reagan. I mean, kind of as recently as Obama, right? He's like, oh, I'll take it from here, guys. No need to do all this grassroots stuff anymore. 